Thanks, Richard. All right. So, it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend David Dark to Oxford. He's here with his daughter, Dorothy Day Dark, who will wander in the back at some point, um, probably with our friend Susan Glisson. He's a thinker who manages to be both fierce and kind. A writer whose prose shows us that fierceness and kindness don't have to be oppositional forces. He's a Christian of the Will D. Campbell School. Uh, an active, thank you for the folks who recognize the name, long <laughs> may his name reign. Um, he's an active rejecter of received knowledge, a susser out of truths and mysteries that add up to beauty. He's adapted coinage. In this new book, you'll encounter new terms like chumocracy and beyondism, and my favorite, robot soft exorcism. <laughs> Tim is appropriate. Um, he's a walking and talking and singular kind of OED of a sort. Poetry is, in the world according to Dark, that which makes things new. Philosophy is the active love of wisdom. David Dark is a lifelong resident of Nashville. His family is from just north of here, just north of Corinth. Grew up in the Church of Christ, taught in the Tennessee Prison for Women, and at Belmont University, where he teaches now, and where he serves the university as Associate Professor of Religion and the Arts. He publishes a substack called Dark Matter. He's the author of three books, The Sacredness of Questioning Everything, The Possibility of America, Everyday Apocalypse. There's a long subtitle. I'm skipping it. Um, he's finishing a book about U2 called what? Um, explain All These Controls, U2 and the Inner America. All right. Um, that will be from University of Texas Press, which does a really good job with music books. Um, he's a man of pronouncements and provocations, like pop culture eats white supremacist terror for breakfast. We can ask him about that later. Um, and appropriate to a university town, an institution is a myth with a budget. Um, he is, in the words of our family friend Julia Mitchell, one of his students at Belmont, straight, non-diluted fertilizer for growing minds. <laughs> And he's here tonight to read and converse. And I believe the reading part begins first. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. I'm going to need a copy of all of them. Um, I want it out on God's Internet forever. And um, I will, with pleasure, um, read from this book, and then we'll have some conversation. And then hopefully there will be some questions and we can have some back and forth. Um, yes, the title of this one. We become what we normalize, what we owe each other, and worlds that demand our silence. And I want to say right away that we become what our norm we become what we normalize is a saying that has arisen for me as a kind of stay against confusion in recent years. As a personal admonition, we become what we normalize. We become what we sit still for. We become what we play along with. Um, I don't offer those as once forever universal dictums, but maybe I do. Maybe they're, I think they're helpful in um, a wide variety of contexts. I try to start, I do address um, news cycles. I address the last five to six years in the state of Tennessee and these United States, but I try to start with myself. I try to implicate myself first by noting all of the ways that I myself um, succumb to what I call deferential fear, um, all the ways that I myself succumb to a kind of moral obliviousness in my interaction with others and in my processing of news. But I'm going to go ahead and read. I'm going to read right now. Here we go. Um, this is the introduction. And... Um, the introduction is titled, Is This Thing On? Being Harmed and Harming Through Shame. There's a thing I do that scares me. More than once, I've been behind the wheel of a vehicle at, say, a four-way stop. I've gotten so distracted that I've screwed up. I've stayed stopped too long. I hit the gas too soon. 
I've missed my cue. Sometimes my missed cues have involved pedestrians entering a crosswalk. Avoiding grave mishaps, I've recovered myself in time that these incidents recur. They are, I admit, a part of my life. Here's the part that scares me more. A time or two, I've been so ashamed over this public, verifiable, vehicular error that I put the pedal to the metal to hasten my escape from the situation. Ever notice somebody doing that? An audible, visible acceleration, clearly born of shame? It's hard to watch, cringeworthy. I've been that guy. I peel out, out of embarrassment at being seen. In that moment, I'm trying to escape a form of pain, fleeing the scene of my own felt shame. By doing this, I realize I look as I feel, silly, egotistical, ignorant, and driven by ugly feelings. It's messy. Who's making me feel so small? Nobody. Nobody to blame, really, apart from my hurried, distracted, reactive self. But my goodness, I'd sure like to blame someone, most anyone, most anything, to deflect attention anywhere but here. An awful lot of my life, if I'm not careful, can get spent anxiously, also strategically, avoiding anything that risks shame or humiliation. My reactive self can't handle it. My responsive and responsible self can. I contain multitudes. Is this thing on? This is a question I ask every which way. I ask it to center myself. I'm tapping the microphone of my own thoughts and feelings. I'm putting my hand over my heart, taking my temperature. I'm asking if my deepest and most creatively responsive self, my moral center, is online, available, and perhaps rising to the surface. I ask this question before speaking, driving, tweeting, signing my name, or clicking send. I get into trouble when I don't. It's as much about my being present to the moment as it is about public interaction. It's sometimes hard to let go my ego. I emit what I admit. Is this thing on? I ask this question socially. I wonder aloud if I'm being heard, if the person I'm talking to is being heard. If I'm getting through, if the signals they intend are being received, if the conversation is a genuinely two-way street. The intention at work in my speech will rarely, if ever, coincide with the impact of my words. So asking the question has me taking it slow and asking how I'm being heard or if I'm hearing the other person at all. I circle back, revise aloud, listen more, back down, change and adjust my posture and position. I can apologize for what I set down less than thoughtfully earlier in the day, or seconds ago, or years ago. It's when my reactive self convinces me there's no circling back this time that I meet trouble. I find it's hard to hear anything at all when I feel defensive or afraid. The thing that is or isn't on is a lot of things. Awareness, or the possibility of awareness. Consciousness, or the possibility of consciousness. Movement, or the possibility of movement. I think to myself, anima, which also refers to soul, that which gives life to bodies. I go looking for it, within and without, on paper, on screens, on people's faces, in sounds and voices and gestures, in design and architecture, too. I look for soul, movement, in the choices people make, my choices and the choices of others. Flustered or afraid, I hit the gas pedal and lose, in that mad moment, my sense of soul. But I get back when I slow down and take it easy again. Turns out it didn't go anywhere. Soul is that which truly connects. The movement that sustains and supports responsive and responsible selves across distances and at intersections. The movement, the play, a 
of seeing, learning, listening, and imagining myself and others well. When I'm relaxed, breathing, curious, I spy soul all around and within me, a current, a sense of play that soothes my reactive self if I let it. Transformation is often just one smidgen or snatch of soul away. To find courage, I seek out unflustered, unafraid people, making soulful decisions, beautiful decisions, in news cycles, in history, in art, in literature, in scripture, and on the internet, as the saying goes. I collect and internalize these examples to mimic and draw inspiration from when I'm soaking in reactivity at the four-way stop and other nervy feeling moments in my everyday doing and saying. When I hit a snag or get to feeling somehow stymied, thinking of and recalling playful people at the right moment puts my heart and soul back in play and makes it more likely that I'll be able to proceed through all manner of intersections without disrespecting, debasing, or disgracing myself. With their assistance, the assistance of those who have shown soul, I can occasionally proceed through life with attention and caution, curiosity, and style. I think I will speak of Will Campbell, if that works. So, in the book, I go to Patti Smith, and I go to LeBron James, and I go to Tony K. Bambara. I go to any number of people, James Baldwin. Um, but there's a sense in which Will Campbell is the exemplar of soul for me, because he is one who taught me that um, our only chance, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, is to show as much of ourselves to others as our nervous system will allow. And um, he noted that that's not very far. So most of us don't get very far. Um, I try to choose um, transparency, candor, and confession over um, defensiveness, hiddenness, and um, mistaking my position for my person. So part of what the book is arguing, part of what I'm arguing, is that we need never mistake ourselves for our positions, and we need never mistake others for their positions. I can love someone and find their position contemptible and, and say so. I can say I agree with you here, here, and here, um, but this here um, is morally unserious. That's one of my sorry. <laughs> that's one of my, it's not a trick. I mean it. I mean it. But I've dropped the phrase lately. Baseline moral seriousness. To describe a kind of imagined baseline of um, I guess we could say moral adulthood in a way. One hears the phrase being the adult in the room. I would say many are are accrue much credit and coin by refusing to be adults um, by refusing to say what they see. And um, yeah, I don't want to ramble too long without questions and combos, but I do want to say that Will Campbell, who I read about as a teenager, who I eventually came to know personally, and who I got some significant time with before he passed, has been my um, literal and imagined mentor for much of my adult life. And when I think what the price he paid for refusing to play along at key moments, and the price he paid for refusing to treat people like caricatures and cartoons of themselves, is a price that I try to um, keep in front of me all the time. I hear, this came up in our phone conversation, but I hear his voice in my head often um, asking, what do you want to see happen? which does that work that I'm describing in that first section of um, kind of taking the temperature of my own um, soul in some way. And David, for those in the audience who don't know Will Campbell's work, I bet they're few, but it would be good to speak to his yes. work and give a oh, baseball I card iteration. I will give a baseball card iteration with joy. Um, <laughs> will Campbell was a World War II veteran um, who served in the Pacific, and before that, he accepted the call at maybe the age of 15 
or 16, uh, Baptist minister. And um, he, on the GI Bill, he went on to Yale, white man, I will say, and um, went on to Yale, but if you visited his workspace, he had um, his certificate of, uh, his calling to ministry was placed in front of his Yale Divinity Masters. So he brought that kind of chutzpah with him, his refusal to respect, um, well, positions, institutions, titles. And um, he was close to Chris Christopherson. He was close to Martin Luther King Jr. He introduced Walker Percy and Thomas Merton to each other. He baptized Waylon Jennings' son in front of Muhammad Ali. He was all over the place, and when he passed, he was on the cover of the New York Times. Mm-hmm. That he, but that was a kind of indictment of, I guess I'll say, the popular news media not knowing where to put it. Um, they, they didn't know where to put it. And he, um, John Lewis was a big fan. Jimmy Carter was a big fan. James Lawson, um, essentially the architect of the lunch counter sit-ins, in Nashville, 1959-1960, um, Vanderbilt Divinity, um, because they were dealing with a PR disaster because Lawson was a student there, Vanderbilt asked James Lawson to withdraw as a student, and Will Campbell um, said, make him kick you out. Like he counseled him to not be polite. Um, in a meeting with the Board of Trustees, they tried to keep Will out, said this is just family, to which James Lawson said Will is family, and brought him in. Um, And as you may know, there is now a James Lawson um, kind of Peace and Justice Center at Vanderbilt, and James Lawson has since um, taught at Vanderbilt. So Will is one he was also the chaplain at Ole Miss for a time. So his, his history, um, yeah, he is the path not taken in so many ways. I wish that Will's work, um, Brother to a Dragonfly, for instance, was on sale at Cracker Barrel right now. That would be nice. Um, I know because Will told me that when Chris Christopherson was on The Tonight Show, um, Johnny Carson weirdly said to Christopherson, this would have been the Barbara Streisand film being promoted, I think, Star is Born. Um, Johnny Carson said, are you reading anything? And uh, Christopherson, yes, I am. I, I'm reading a book by my friend Will Campbell. And he said, I can't remember the title. And so there were all these moments in which Will might have been famous or more of a household name. I think that Horton Foot did a screenplay of Brother to a Dragonfly that never took off. But he's this much somewhat passed over figure um, who if you lived in Nashville at a particular time you knew you knew the name Will Campbell. I wanted to ask you about the Will's active mistrust, distrust of institutions. Um, and and that seems manifest in your book. Um, I won't replay your own quotes to you, yes. but but um, talk to us about that. And I said that playfully at the beginning of my yes. remarks. You know, we just, um, earlier today, I was in attendance as our university celebrated its 175th anniversary, and one of our friends and colleagues, Katie McKee, gave a really great, honest talk about our university and the promise of our university and some of the failings of our university. Um, But and here we speak of Will, who worked at this university um, and believed in this place in his own way. Um, But talk to us about your idea of robots and of institutions yes. and I because I find it fascinating and it really helped me think through my relationship to an institution, various institutions. I thank you for saying so. Um, I will note that I imagine Will saying that institutions are evil <laughs> and that kind of being the end of it in some way. <laughs> Just I like, also, <laughs> like he said when he <laughs> asked about um, about capital punishment, he said it's tacky. That's right. He showed up for a debate. He didn't know it was a debate. He showed up to talk. It was a pro-con thing. And um, the pro-state killing guy um, talked for 15 minutes, and then Will stepped forward and said, I think it's tacky. <laughs> and, and, but he, when pushed, he said it's ugly. 
and he said, some, and he said something along the lines of, um, beauty is at the heart of morality, empathy, education. Beauty prepares the heart for justice, I say, he might say. Um, institutions are constellations of power that um, an institution is a myth with a budget. Um, I sometimes say an institution can be a legacy, in which case an institution is a gift, but an institution can also be a dynasty, in which case an institution is a grift. Demanding sacrifice, demanding the active suppression of conscience of those who draw a living from the institution. I have many institutions myself, um, but we got to be careful with them. Um, I've heard it said that institutions, uh, communities make sacrifices for people. Institutions sacrifice people. And will, I don't want to go too far into scripture, because uh, I don't want to <laughs> push anybody away, but will is informed <laughs> by the language of the Apostle Paul, which is we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And I do think that that's at work, in, even in what we're told were among Jesus' last words, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. There is something that is less than them that is inciting this mob to torture, call for my death, jeer at me. And um, Robot Soft Exorcism, without going too far in the weeds of that chapter, is an elaboration on this idea of institutions um, as constellations of power. Um, a quick one, uh, a quick illustration for robot soft exorcism. Ole Miss is a robot. Um, Missis the government of Mississippi is a robot. The state of Tennessee government, robot. Belmont University, robot. Taylor Swift, a human being with a heartbeat, encased in a robot that is Taylor Swift, the brand. Mm -hmm. I'm drawing from William Stringfellow, who was close to Will, who said Marilyn Monroe, though dead, um, lives in the sense that the estate, Elvis, dead, <laughs> you believe it, but the estate <laughs> continues and the estate doesn't want this new Sofia Coppola film called Priscilla um, to use the music of Elvis Presley. So that's a quick one. Um, robots are organizations, institutions, brands. To name some of my robots, um, Belmont, State of Tennessee, downtown Presbyterian Church, where I'm a member. Um, broadly, my publisher on this one, a kind of robot. Um, we all have our robots. We become what we do with our robots. And um, the oh, the big challenge is to not mistake ourselves. And this is drawn from Merton. Merton said when you have a system and somebody, you're part of the system, and someone attacks that system, if you aren't careful, you're liable to think that they're attacking you. There, there may be coming at the robot. Maybe the robot has something to answer for. I don't know that a robot will apologize. I don't know that institutions can show courage. But people within institutions can move those institutions to be more transparent, more honest about their past, how they came to be. So quickly, robot soft exorcism. If you can imagine a robot and a person in the... This is just... Crazy. I, I do a pretty good job with words, but stay with me on this. Um, imagine a human being outside of the robot, perhaps about to be crushed by it. Oh, think of the human, the righteous human that came to be referred to as tank man outside of the tank in Tiananmen Square. So that's kind of an illustration. As is Jesus before Pontius Pilate, saying, I'm a human being, you're a human. Um, might you step outside of the armored vehicle and be a human being with me? That, that's, that's the job. And I'll draw from another person close to Will, Dana Berrigan, um, who often said, stand where you must stand, be human man. And that, that is the move that is um, calling the person to be more than their power, privilege, position. To be a, a bear for the animal. Shakespeare puts it, which is what we all are. It, it reminds me of a conversation I had recently with Bart Elmore, who teaches at Ohio State University uh, and was here a couple of weeks ago. 
and we were talking about his first book, which was called Citizen Coke, um, and it was a, it's a look at the ways in which Coke pioneered outsourcing, um, and, and in doing so, outsourced its responsibility um, for its impact in the world. And in that book, he wrote a critique of um, Coca-Cola, and he realized by the time he wrote his second book, which was about Monsanto, it was a tougher book and a, a more critical book. He actually got a better reception from Monsanto because he wrote the book and entered into conversation with the people who worked at Monsanto. Because yeah. um, he was trying, he was actually trying to recognize there are people who work within these corporations who are doing you know things that serve the corporation, but my critique is of the corporation, not of those people. That's it. Yeah, I, I would never want to uh, um, mistake, and, and you can name. I mean, take the person that you think of as a powerfully abusive person in the world, um, were I on an elevator with them, I think my job would be to see them as a child, as a human being, as a fellow creature. And it's, it's a challenge, imaginatively. But if I'm going to be poetic, and if I'm going to be prophetic in my engaging of the person, I'm going to have to appeal to, to borrow from the Quakers that of God within them, rather than villainizing, demonizing. Um, even if I think that they are essentially uh, a billionaire hireling of some sort, I don't have to drop the word hireling um, in that moment. I, I get to approach the person as humanly as I can. But there probably is a time to tell someone that they are playing the function of an abusive person. I mean, that's part of the, thank you so much for the words starting out. That is the fierceness. Um, I don't have to, um, I don't have to normalize bad behavior, and I don't have to sit still um, for publicly abusive behavior um, from my fellow human beings. I, I, in talking to a friend about this book, I described it as kind of a toolkit for this moment, this political moment, this social moment. Mm -hmm. um, would you have it read that way? I would, and yes, absolutely. I would hasten to add that it's it's guesswork, it's field work, it's drawing from some of my own experiences in the classroom, where I know that if a student um, offers an opinion that is a bigoted opinion or a um, toxic position, that my job is to keep the the movement going such a way that I can affirm what little thing I can so as to avoid shutting down the student or the friend or the um, family member who says things that are not morally serious. So part of, I think it was um, Claudia Rankin who said it's impossible to learn something while feeling shut down. So I'm trying to speak truthfully and candidly and even prophetically without shutting down the person. And I think that is part of the, the toolkit when we are in relationship with and under the, um, under the uh, I won't say gun, but I will say under, there are those who will not acknowledge um, that the last presidential election was won fairly who are now exercising power um, over us. And we saw it just a couple weeks ago in the case of Speaker Mike Johnson when a reporter said, can we talk about your attempt to overturn the election? The reporter was told to shut up um, by the chair of the Education Committee in the House of Representatives. So when it, it's disappeared to the bottom of the internet already, even though it was only two weeks ago. I think we have to keep leaning into those moments and saying, um, this isn't acceptable. And when you say to lean into those moments, um, and I talk about this as a toolkit, you know, we are tomorrow um, holding an election here. Sure. And what advice um, does this book offer or might you offer to us um, on both sides of that election? Um, I don't want to assume we know um, how people are going to vote. Um, Yes. <laughs> I, I want to say I myself have voted every which way. Um, 
I'll note that part of what I talk about in the book was a time when a person named Rush Limbaugh, perhaps you've heard of him, or you know that name, Rush Limbaugh, <laughs> um, in which he occupied more of my mental space than was appropriate. And I, I, would, I would repeat things that he had told me on the radio, and I would trick myself into thinking that they were my ideas. Um, nevertheless, he was like an espresso shot of self-confidence on the radio as I was headed into sociology class. He met a felt need in me, but I also knew people who held that against me, but did not hold other things against me, who were willing to maximize my other qualities and who helped me to allow other people into my head um, in what I sometimes think of as my pantheon of elders. Um, Rush Limbaugh was not elder enough uh, for, for me. I needed more, and I had people who exercised a kind of intellectual hospitality toward me that would enjoy my love of R.E.M. or Dostoevsky or Public Enemy or whatever it was. And, and I think that is the work, is to affirm what we can when we can, but to also challenge... Um, Ah, maybe risk jeopardizing not, not relationships, but jeopardizing the approval of others. Um, a, a question that I pose in the book that I will not answer now, that I will lift it up now. Um, am I responsible for the lies I let other people voice in my presence unchallenged? I will repeat the question. Am I responsible for the lies I let other people voice in my presence unchallenged. So much depends upon context and personal safety. But I am leaning toward um, I'm responsible. Um, because I, I believe that I do become what I normalize. And if I play along to get along, mm -hmm. if I actively suppress my moral conscience in order to maintain my position, I think the price is too high for that position. And um, that is part of the challenge. But, but as well, um, to help people know, to make, there are those who held a door open for me when I had succumbed to the disinformation of uh, the for-profit disinformation industry, of which Rush Limbaugh was the primary figure. Um, disinformation remains a business model in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And um, I get to challenge um, those who are host bodies to the talking points of bad faith operatives. Um, again, slowly. <laughs> slowly, one person at a time. Merton says that the reality of personal relationships changes everything. And if I have a student who's about ready to um, target me online, um, if I can communicate a kind of respect to that student, um, despite that, I can maybe save both our lives in some way, because both of us are trying. <coughs> Thoreau says we all crave reality. I think that's true. So I try to appeal to the part of people that is craving reality, um, that it's a dance. It's an everyday do-over kind of thing, and I, and I mess up. I have one more question, and I'm going to open it up to friends in the audience. Um, one of the things I like about this book, I described it as a toolkit a moment ago, um, there are succinct observations that stick with me, um, that, that, I, that, that I ruminate on, that, I, that I turn in my head, which is you know, what good writing can do for us. And I, I think about one observation you made, that decisions create culture. Yeah. Um, and that's simple at its core. Um, and it makes me think about the related question, which is what decisions created the culture in which you live in Tennessee and which we live in Mississippi? Wow. Um, okay, so I want to say quickly, I purloined decisions create culture from my friend, Dr. Christina Edmondson of Nashville. Um, she floated that on Twitter one day, and I thought, oh, that's it. Decisions create culture. And, and I will say quickly, I am a um, um, 53 Nashville lifer. I went to a private school connected to a church, which 
which it wasn't until I was long out of that school that I recognized that I attended what I will call a segregation academy. <coughs> I did not think of it as a segregation academy at the time, but after graduating in 88, I started meeting people and I realized that my Franklin Road Academy was a segregation academy. Not just a segregation academy, but it's important to note that it was. And um, even now, there is a contempt for the public good. There was a contempt for the public good um, in the late 60s, early 70s, when these schools started showing up. Um, but it's still there right now in the sense that I don't want to go right to a challenging thing, but I, but I will say that um, in the case of Tennessee, and I know some of these figures, I would say, that my state legislature is controlled um, by a kind of gun cult, as well as what I will call a white supremacist death cult. Um, yeah, I'm going to say both of those things. <laughs> nobody, nobody suggests any of those things. Oh, and I will say, too, I don't know that anybody's happy with it, including the people sitting in the seats. But there is this spirit of conflict avoidance, a democracy where crushingly powerful white people in Tennessee are not ready to risk upsetting each other. And I am a product of, of that. I will say that um, whiteness is a crime against my own humanity that I am trying to recognize more. I'm trying to see um, its hold on me, and I'm trying to um, divest from it, and um, so much of that is at work in Nashville, in Tennessee. I will, I will let you all figure out. Apply it to your own context as you wish to. But I'm one who means to recover, who means to move toward transformative justice, who means to be a part of a loved community, to behave like the child of God that I know myself to be, that I believe everyone to be. Um, yeah, and to appeal to the moral center in, in every human being who's ever lived. And um, but yeah, decisions create culture, and there's a lot of new culture, a lot of recovery, a lot of transforming, a lot of transparency, confession, all of that to be undertaken in my context, and I suspect in some of your contexts. And I don't mean to, I didn't mean to lead you to a dark place. No, no. Um, um, because your book is rife with pop culture yeah. um, and joy as well. Thank you. Um, and, and I find it in equal measure. It's that fierceness and beauty that I yes. find in your writing. I find you on the page, that same person, Thank full you. of all those things. Uh, so, um, I promise questions. Um, we want questions. David needs questions. I do. <laughs> He does. Um, <laughs> satisfy his craving, Melissa Hall. Um, so, you are a morally serious person <coughs> in what may be the least morally serious place left on the planet, and that is Twitter. Or X, or whatever you yeah, yeah. call it. And I'm curious why you're hanging in there. In the ways that you're hanging in there. Yes, I am optimistic to the point of denial. <laughs> um, I also have an obsessiveness in me to kind of see a thing. In the classroom, which is where I live much of my life, um, I follow that improv rule of yes and. And even in my grading of writing, I look for phrases and things that I can affirm while putting difficult questions to the prose of students. Um, and I might be, uh, who knows, um, I keep waiting for my access to Twitter to disappear because I'm not willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's such a shame. Because there was a time when it had the potential of a kind of live action, quicker Wikipedia, in a way. And it is certainly the case that when it comes to filming um, arrests and uh, protests and stuff, there's still nothing quite like Instagram, Facebook, to a degree Twitter in terms of filming something and now it's publicly available and now as a form of witness um, immediate 
um, online, I used to say, I don't know if it's the case now, that Twitter is like paper, except quicker. That it's just out there. I think it's certainly the case that the last um, um, Joe Biden's predecessor could not have won the election without Twitter, and I believe that he said so. Um, I think I view it as a common... I'm just not quite willing to abandon the field yet. Um, and I've made real friendship with people who I've met up with and, um, overseas and in California and sat down. So I'm, I, there's some nostalgia there. There's also um, an awful lot that once appeared on Twitter shows up here. So I, have, I don't know anybody else who does this, but I treated it as a kind of notepad for a while. Mm -hmm. That if I read a John McCarry line and I liked it, I would mark it in the book I was reading. But I would also just put it on Twitter, just see what happens. Um, you might be surprised to know that I don't have it on my phone. I only have it on a computer, on my laptop. Um, yeah, it might be over, but I think it, it served me well as a tool for a time. And I don't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> never. I would not recommend it to anybody. But there are folks there um, that put questions to me that end up being really great writing prompts. And I'm just, I'm always looking for the question. And sometimes Twitter is the quickest available uh, mm -hmm. challenge or um, to get poked at it. People have accused me of things on Twitter. And I will reply, could you put that accusation in the form of a question? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do. And then we're <laughs> off. And then I've got another paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to put something in the form of a question at this moment in our evening? So, so I was listening very carefully to your uh, opening, which I love. It was, it was very thought-provoking. Thank you. Um, and please uh, correct me if I get this wrong, but as I listened, I heard some uh, elements of shame in, in, in some of these observations that you were making. And then some of that shame, the propulsion from that shame affecting your future behavior choices. Yeah. And I wonder about that, you know, shame being a foundational platform for some of this behavior and whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. And I think that's something we all deal with. Thank you for this. Um, often foundational. I, I think the avoidance of shame is often the avoidance of pain, is often the avoidance of certain realizations. Um, my wife, Sarah, says, um, has a line in one of her songs where she says, sitting with anger till it becomes sadness. And um, she's also said, sad, mad is often a form of sad. So I have this whole thing on reactivity and responsiveness. Um, even the robots as a kind of concentrated reactivity of the masses, we're going to protect ourselves from something. Um, my challenge to myself is to see what's on the other side of shame, even with my memories. And I get pretty specific in a chapter. You're going to think it's, I mean, you won't think it's a joke probably because you've heard enough from me. I know it's both funny, but it's also descriptive. There's a chapter that is um, white supremacist, antichrist, poltergeist. And it's, it's a lot. But it's a lot of syllables to name a kind of shamey type force, um, a terror in the world that often disincentivizes people in my position or with my background from looking hard at some of their past positions. I'll, I'll say that at 53, if you could take stuff from my college newspaper or think of that I wrote people in letters and put them on the internet, 18, 19, 20, late 80s, early 90s, I don't know that I would have my position at Belmont. So I'm <laughs> recognizing that I've held some very toxic conceptions of myself, others, and God. And shame can prevent me from sitting with particular memories um, and even narrating those memories. I guess I'll throw in that as an associate professor at Belmont, I can muse publicly over some horrible ideas I had in the late 80s, early 90s that I probably, I would not muse publicly 
if I sold real estate for a living or if I had a dental practice because I, I would be risking um, being targeted and um, losing my, my overhead, um, my house, my access to health care, all those things. But my challenge is see what's on the other side of shame. And I try to do that very specifically in mem some of my memories with Reverend Lawson at Vanderbilt and specifically memories, I won't get into it here, of um, seeing Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing and um, loving the film, but also um, being very challenged by it and not and saying things. Um, hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't want to give it all away, but I have some shamey memories of a public showing of Do the Right Thing where Giancarlo Esposito and Joey Lee were there and some of the thoughts I had toward them that eventually I had to essentially repent of and, and get clear of. So shame um, is no destination. I think Jung says that shame kind of eats away at the soul in a way. So I don't want to promote shame, but I do want to promote um, seeing what might be on the other side of it when we can hold our shame out in productive and healing ways. So I know that you like questions, and I have a lot of them, but it starts with a statement. Yeah. Um, the statement is that children are more important than adults. Mm. And we, we've talked a lot about that. We've talked about children being second-class citizens. We've yeah. talked about how to serve them best. Yeah. And so there's a whole string of questions that comes off of that is, if they are more important than adults, what do we owe the children of the world? Um, what should we police for them? What should we shield them from? How do we clear the way for them? How do we hold them? But how do we teach them about shame and what it does to people without making them experience it themselves yeah. or making them experience it without guidance? Mm. Okay, that last one I want to do a resounding, I'm not sure, off the top of it's my okay, head. Me neither. <laughs> but I do think that children, um, yeah, this is a strange thing to say, but I think that children are like natural prophets among us. Um, <clears throat> I believe that children are closer to their own genius um, than adults. I believe it's the case that the artist is the child who survives adulthood. And I know I, I used the word adulthood in a more positive way a moment ago, but there's a kind of thing that comes with adulthood that is denial in a lot of ways, that is um, shutting down the spirit of play movement, um, finding it harder to say what we see. Children naturally say what they see, mm -hmm. and they deserve protection. I think that children, you yeah, to put a thing out there, I think that children have a right to not be beaten, um, to not suffer spiritual abuse. Um, and it's just a constant, it's a work. We get to respond to children as the holy beings that they are and um, learn, ask, nurture, and um, serve. I think it was, I don't know if it was Rimbaud or Baudelaire who said that genius is the recovery of childhood, that those early memories of nurture, um, I don't mean to presume that every human being has those memories, but um, kids are a big deal, and we get, I don't even want to call them a resource, except um, receive the wisdom of children and share what wisdom we have with children. But I'm, I'm not sure on the shame thing other than um, note that um, moving a child toward, mm, yeah, I don't want to get heavy, but Jesus has very harsh words um, of preventative. Oh, this just gets so heavy right away. So, <laughs> but you know the really difficult thing Jesus says, if you're about to hurt a child, go do this. Um, I'm referring to the millstone business. And I think of um, Tupac's line, the hate you give little infants, because we're being filmed, F's everyone. <laughs> and um, I think those are solid sayings that we have to live in awareness of. I have a, a statement, I guess it's linked, that 
I was trying to pin specifics on some of the things you were saying, just to kind of keep me on, on board. And um, when you were talking about the Tennessee politics, um, I recall a clip from the news after the school massacre. Yes, covenant shooting. Yes, and um, it was just, I had caught this glimpse on the TV of parents wailing. There was a protest in, yep. at the, uh, in the Capitol, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And um, the, I believe they were up mm -hmm. on a balcony, yeah. and then the legislature was down here. And to me, that is such a great example of the souls versus the machine. Yes. They were wailing. Their children had been slaughtered. Yes. And that this body was unmoved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just is like I'm going to walk away from here trying to, you know, think about children mm -hmm. and how we turn our backs on them and um, just, you know, children as metaphors and, yeah. and real flesh. And I'll note there is a robot self-exorcism thing going on there in terms of demanding of these people who have sworn to protect and serve um, that they stop, that they move toward moral seriousness. And I'll, I'll mention I, Catherine Kuntz, who was the head of school, who was killed protecting the children, was one of my colleagues at Christ Press. Mm -hmm. And Covenant and Christ Press are both part of a PCA um, conglomerate of churches. And um, um, a thing that has come out of this is we have the George Floyd summer in which predominantly black protesters were demanding common sense gun laws addressing extrajudicial killing of uh, black people in Tennessee and throughout the country. Um, but uh, a move that occurred following the Covenant shooting is we had similar numbers, even more numbers, of mostly black people, mothers shooting, um, affecting a, a kind of suburb in Nashville, whereas that kind of violence had been in other parts of Nashville before. But we also had, in Governor Lee's willingness to meet with white families who he knew personally, um, some members of those white families publicly grieved the fact that Governor Lee had not been willing to meet black families. And that's, that's a new moment in terms of these demographics coming together in a way that, though we didn't get the results we wanted from the special session, um, there's people running for office who never dreamt that they would run for office before, and there does seem to be an awakening, especially in regard to Gloria Johnson, Justin Pearson, and Justin Jones, who first made the news um, during the Free the Plaza movement, when for two months um, people camped out in the plaza um, until eventually Governor Lee made it a crime to uh, assemble to avoid uh, the horrible optics of being unwilling to meet with these citizens. It is 6.25, which would allow us one short question, and it's right here. So I want to ask you about this work that you're writing and talking about, affirming yet challenging people, mm -hmm. um, preserving relationships, yet speaking truth to moral and seriousness. It seems a subtle work. Mm -hmm. We are a small group interested in hearing about it tonight. How hopeful are you that this can move us toward the transformational justice that you're talking about? Um, I'm very hopeful that it happens kind of one person at a time. Um, I'm also hopeful, um, yeah, it's a subtle thing. I, I was interviewed about the book a week or two ago, and somebody said, is there a time to uh, walk away? Like, you seem to have quite the appetite for keeping at it with people. <laughs> is there a time to kind of draw a boundary? And I, I said, yes. Um, the older I get, the more content I am to infuriate people um, for the right reasons. So I'm, I'm good with arriving, like finally we've reached a disagreement. Like that, that can happen. <laughs> I've heard it said that, um, 
I think Karl Barth said that when you, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you, if there is no difference in that passing of the peace, um, the peace isn't there because there is no gap, there is no difference to, to cover in that instance. Um, I think people love a good conversation. I, even when people make, take a, a um, jab at me for something they know I believe, I tend to think that that is their way, their awkward way of trying to keep a conversation going. I think people desire engagement. Um, but I think there does come a time to um, possibly lovingly spurn someone. As in, um, <clears throat> there was a time when I would have coffee with anyone. Um, lately, I kind of want to know what they want to talk about before Because <laughs> I need to know who I'm getting. So I know there is, I do think of every human being as an infinitely valuable bearer of God's image. But I don't know that that's what they're going to bring um, to the Starbucks. Sometimes I think, in some instances, they're going to use the fact that I let them buy my coffee against me later. Or even, I mean, this is it, but there's a lot of interpersonal cruelty out there. There's a lot of vindictive. Because, again, because people confuse their persons for their positions, where people really, really go after people. Um, but I'll say, um, maybe somewhat positively, even those who I feel have kind of come after me, part of my own work is doing a kind of, saying the person's name, may fill in the blank, no joy in the root of joy, may fill in the blank, be delivered from suffering. I have to do that in order to sleep at night. Um, Anthony Ray Hinton, who spent 30, almost 30 years on death row in Alabama um, for crimes that he did not commit, was our speaker at Belmont last fall. I booked him. I interviewed him and introduced him. And he said, I have to forgive because my mother taught me that I can't hate my way to heaven. And um, he means it. But he also knows that there are those who are his enemy. Um, but he also knows that in some sense, he's called to love his enemy, which doesn't mean that he has to sit down with everybody um, who is lined up against him. So I'm trying to do a bit of a both hand. Um, I think everybody wants a conversation. I think everybody wants to unburden themselves in some way. So when I think of it on a personal level, I, I feel a lot of hope. And when I think of the Monsanto folks, um, these people in these positions, um, in many ways, are grieving their, their work while they're undertaking it and trying to give people a path um, toward being less horrible is, is the work, is the kind of hospitality that's been extended to me. And um, I think there's all kinds of ways of keeping I'm sorry, but if I didn't ramble. <laughs> you, you rambled well. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we, should, we should save some time for commerce because we want y'all to buy this book. That's true. Mm -hmm. it is. Tell your friends um, about this book. <laughs> um, so let us now thank David for his time. <laughs>